Hey everybody, it's Adam, live and in person for you. Hey everybody, it's Adam, wonder who he'll interview, call me Adam.com. Hi everybody, my name is Adam Rothenberg. For those of you who don't know me, I have been conducting interviews for the past 12 years from the world of film, television, theater, and music. With over 1,500 interviews under my belt, I pull back the curtain to reveal the secrets of my guests' lives and careers. And today, I am so excited to be back in the closet where I conduct all of my interviews with four-time Emmy nominee, Sharon Lawrence. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Adam. How are you? I'm well, I'm well. It's a beautiful day here in Calgary where I am finishing up the second season of Joe Pickett, a show that I've been part of now for, for two years. And it's a very bittersweet time because um, we are, we're wrapping up. We'll, I'll finish this week, but then I start uh, diving into the, the, the play, The Shot, that we'll be presenting at the end of next week in New York. So it's whirlwind, but like I said, bittersweet because I love where I am. So we're very excited that you are coming to New York for the show, The Shot, which is going to be a part of the United Solo Festival. Um, so that is what we're here to talk about today. So how did this project come to you? The playwright, Robin Gerber, who is not only a former union lobbyist, but also... Uh, a biographer, her great subjects are women's leadership. And Eleanor Roosevelt is where she spent much of her time before she pivoted to Catherine Graham. And after writing a biography of Kay Graham, the famed and Pulitzer Prize winning publisher of the Washington Post during the Pentagon Papers and the Watergate era, someone said to her, you should write this part of her life prior to when she became publisher as a play. I met Robin through a women in film event that I was hosting because I've been part of women in films leadership uh, in the late 1990s and early to mid 2000s. So when Robin requested that I take a read of her play, which was all she was asking at the time, I said yes, because I say yes to women as they are launching projects, um, building their, their teams and working to achieve something beyond where they currently are in a, a, at their career level, I try to always say yes. But in the, the type of work that I do, that I could be of assistance of is always a collaboration. And that's my favorite part of working on any project, whether it's film, whether it's television, whether it's stage. So this was an, a natural thing for me to say yes to. I was quite impressed with the play. I recognized that it had great potential and was certainly a tour de force for any actor. Uh, it was accepted at the Ojai Playwrights Conference in uh, pre-pandemic. And I had the honor of working on that play with a wonderful dramaturge who's also a playwright and an actor named Michelle Joyner. We presented a section of it at that play, Ojai Playwrights Conference and decided at that point with the encouragement of everyone who saw it, that this was something that we should work on as a team and hopefully present um, in whatever form we felt it, it was ready to take. And that meant perhaps a reading first, and uh, we had that scheduled at the Wilshire Ebell in Los Angeles, the oldest women's club west of the Mississippi. I'm a member there. It was a perfect fit for us because it's about women's leadership and education and history. And it was sort of fubu, which means, you know, for us, by us. And the day that we were to do give the reading in our fine arts auditorium, which is where Amelia Earhart made her last public appearance before her fateful flight, the pandemic shut us down. It was to be March the 15th of that year. Of course, the world, the U.S. shut down on the 13th. Right. Uh, we decided to record this or just work on it over Zoom because we could do that. Technology allowed us. We uh, created it as um, a benefit for domestic violence um, 
organizations because this is examining the life prior to Catherine Graham's taking a leadership role in this paper. Her, her choice to do so was made only three days after her husband, Phil Graham, who was the current publisher, tragically took his own life. He had suffered bipolar disorder for years and um, her stepping into this role was uh, unexpected and she had to grow into the role. But everything that happened to her prior is what we look at in the play, The Shot. Wow. That is like an incredible journey to where you are today. And I love how you mentioned that you love collaboration. It's your favorite kind of work to do and how involved you are in all of these different, you know, women's organizations and do that, how you say yes to so many projects that support and benefit women's and women's issues. And I issues. want to interject here. It took a lot of people saying yes to get us to the point where we can do this presentation at the, the United Solo Festival. It's not a full production because the space at these theaters, even though they're solo shows, it depends on the size and scope of your show. And with only three performances, the parameters we're certainly um, accepting of. But there were other people along the way who said yes to this play. Terry Ball and Vicki Scott, who run a small theater in Santa Barbara, said yes to us. So we were able to do it in a bit more um, completed way. And then we also had a chance to be part of a solo festival at Great Barrington's Public Theater. This is only their second season. And the, we just got word that the play and um, my performance were nominated um, by the, the Berkshire Theater critics. So it has gained, um, gained support, gained people's uh, interest and investment. And we're very proud of that because this should be a play about galvanizing truth. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's, it's very, very much an honor to have the, the, the confidence of these people who've joined the journey with us. Yes, and the play is, it's, it is a very heavy topic because it does talk about the domestic abuse that she suffered. Um, how do you, how do you like prepare for this kind of role? Like, how do you get ready for it? Preparing for this has really been about uh, the, the text. Robin is a beautiful writer. She has um, such a, a, a bright and literary and um, emotionally intuitive approach into to this uh, structure and um, examination of how we grow, how do we evolve? And this topic about standing strong, learning, growing, um, finding your own agency in a time, remember this was 1963 mm -hmm. when Catherine Graham was launched into this new role of leadership. And when she was a young woman in the 1930s, 1940s, and then as um, uh, a, a woman raising her family in the 50s, the culture was still not open for women in terms of leadership, but also in terms of domestic issues. Mm -hmm. So so fewer resources and uh, avenues for support mm -hmm. were available. So we're we're looking at this through a time travel mm -hmm. and um, my job to prepare for it is to not just know about the topic at the time what that this issue was at the time but to um, have faith and be be brave and bold in the mercurial nature of memory of the mind um, becoming the people in her life requires a different physicality, a different vocal approach. And all of that has to happen very quickly. So with our wonderful director, Michelle Joyner, who has staged it in a way that um, allows for a lot of visual interest, mm -hmm. um, really primarily just through the actor, uh, I, I, I have to be... Um, 
I call it a ski run and that is what it feels like. And that does, that's not meant to diminish the emotional impact or investment, but it's, there's not a lot of time to ruminate, mm -hmm. to think. So our rehearsals, which were a lot on zoom were, were really meant to dive deep into the topic, to talk about the, the issues and the qualities and the time and how could things like this happen then mm -hmm. and that that's been so helpful I and mean, in it's a it's a sociological examination mm -hmm. yes yes and the the analogy you gave of of having to transform into each character as a ski run it gave me a visual of how quickly you have to maneuver to get into the next character right away because in a one person show it's you mm, right and as somebody who likes collaboration and um how do you how what is it like to perform a like a one person show as opposed to being with you know like on on um uh you know on like a tv show or in like uh when you were in like the revival of cabaret or fiddler on the roof where you have a lot of cast members right well, I, Adam, I asked myself that same question because part of the reason that I went back to do Chicago after I had done so much television was I missed that, that um, sacred moment in time that actors on stage have, not just with each other, but with the whole crew and certainly with the audience. Mm -hmm. Film and television is not like that. Everything is so segmented and seldom are you uh, on a set with everybody that's part of the production, uh, certainly not at the same time. So I wondered, would it be lonely? That was my fear. Mm -hmm. And so far, I've not felt that ex experience. And um, doing a longer run, you know, I, of course, Holland Taylor, people who I admire so much, who have done th this type of, of um, activity, they, they all knew what I learned, which is you're not alone at all. Not just are you not alone because there are, there's a crew, there's a stage manager who's, who really is your, your dance partner because all the light cues and just feeling that, that rhythm, um, uh, getting the, the, the wig designed and, and on and, um, the, the, the makeup, which is not, you know, this kind of makeup, it's a different, it's, it's a makeup that's about the story mm -hmm. that is, uh, is a partnership. And then the characters are my partners mm -hmm. and the audience is an equal partnership in those is that, that triumvirate, yeah. the characters, my energy and theirs. That's fascinating. I love that answer. And I love how you added that the audience and all the other characters you play are are part of that feeling of of collaboration and community. Because I've spoken to a lot of people who do one person shows and I have not heard that before. So I think that's really, really such great insight. And um, what do you relate to most about Catherine's, you know, story? You know, is there anything from your own life that you bring in? to this production? Yes. My degree is in journalism. My father was a journalist. Case Graham's father owned the Washington Post. He was not a reporter. He was not an editor, but he was the publisher, um, committed to informing the public. I grew up watching my father as a reporter and having that value system my degree in journalism is from UNC Chapel Hill, one of the best journalism schools in the country. And I value the media and its impact greatly. So that for me was the touchstone. Journalism is the road not traveled. Mm -hmm. And if I had another lifetime, it would be what I would still be doing i would i would have done and hopefully still be doing because the qualities that make that career appealing and successful are similar to mm -hmm. in particular tenacity mm -hmm. and being curious mm -hmm. 
And you have to, I believe, have both of those qualities to be successful in both of those professions. And uh, for me, this this is what resonated when when I first started working on it and still does. How do you hope this show will help others, especially maybe others who are who have um, gone through domestic violence or who who want to be able to stand up and, you know, get out of their situation? The way that this story unfolds and this is a fictional uh, examination of the life that we know Kay Graham lived and the understanding of the dynamics of that kind of mental illness and how that affects a family and an intimate partnership. So Anyone who's going through this, I hope, recognizes that unlike the women in the 1950s and 60s, there are so many resources available. The issue has not disappeared, and we still need more focus and energy on educating men and women educating mothers and fathers and sons and daughters to recognize the, the, the signs and to understand that there are, you're not alone when, when you are in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. There are so many, many places that can serve your needs, that can inform and uh, that you might be able to actually refer someone that you love who's going through this too. And the need mm -hmm. is in every socioeconomic group. That's one of the, what's important that, that, that a story like this fictionalized telling of this life is important to offer because mm -hmm. it's, it is seen uh, in, in many ways um, erroneously mm -hmm. as a, a, a particular demographic or segment, but it, it knows no boundaries. Yes. Mental illness, domestic violence, intimate partner violence knows no illness. I mean, no, no, no boundaries. Yes. With this show being so heavy, you know, it is a very, you know, um, it, it's a it's a heavy role that you're going to be taking on. How do you uh, decompress after the show or how do you think you will decompress after the show? I think it depends on how the character ends, how what the final um, beats of the play are as to what you need to shake off or what you need to 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 just embrace. But I find that if I um, am very conscious about stretching my body out, loosening up where things where energy might have gotten stuck, a, a walk is always really the answer for me. And I also would love to know. Um, when you're in a show, particularly a theatrical show, but it could also be a, fi a film or, or TV show, um, do you put up any kind of boundaries when you're working? Like, for instance, I had, um, I remember watching an interview with Celine Dion, and when she is on tour, she, between shows, doesn't speak. She would write everything down. So do you have boundaries like that that you put up for yourself? I do. I really protect my sleep. Um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty rigid with what I eat and the time I learned mm -hmm. when I was Velma in Chicago, I, I was in good, I was in good shape to, and, and I was in good shape before the show, which is important because you only have two weeks to be put into that slot. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I learned that I had, I could have a, like a, a, a cup of, tuna salad that I would get from the Starlight Deli across the street from the Schubert Alley. And I had to eat that at, you know, 645 to, so that the protein would process and give me the energy that I needed. Um, I would eat that. I would do my, my ballet bar, Charlotte Dembois, you know, uh -huh. she was, she was the, um, the, uh, the Roxy at the time. And, you know, that was what you do. I was 40. Right. So mm -hmm. I, 
I couldn't do the, the, the old way I'd warm up. Like, you know, when I was 23, which was puff a cigarette, do a plie and off you go. <laughs> um, that was when every dancer smoked and I do not smoke. But I, I did, I do now know that timing for my food is really important mm. and timing for my sleep is really important. And I do protect that. That's fantastic. We, we are out of time. So um, I just want to say to everybody watching, make sure you come see Sharon in the shot in the United Solo Festival. It is October 27th, 28th and November 2nd at Theater Row. I will have the ticket link up on my website, callmeadam.com. And I can't thank you enough for your time today. This has been fantastic. Oh, my pleasure, Adam. Thank you for your interest. It's nice to be in your closet with you. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it very much. He'll get the dirt and the scoop and the story for he happens to be in the know. Just ask anybody who's had him, had him, lived for the business of show. Call me Adam.com.